Cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death worldwide, but many of these deaths are preventable. Identifying who is most at risk can save lives. A calcium score CT is a non-invasive test that takes about a minute to perform that can help you figure out your risk to enable action that can reduce the chance you have a heart attack, stroke, or die. So, should you get a calcium score CT? It may sound like a no-brainer. Shouldn't everyone get one? Unfortunately, it's a little more complex than that. It's not always black and white, no pun intended. My name is Rajesh Bayana. I'm a radiologist in Toronto, Canada. Let's take a closer look. I'm seeing some prominent venture capitalists pushing the idea that everyone over 40 should be getting a calcium score CT because it saves lives. See the post on the screen. Now, I do agree that the coronary calcium CT is a great test when it's done in the right subset of the population. But doing a calcium score CT on absolutely everyone would likely end up leading to more harm than good and would be very costly to the system. It's important to point out that many of the dramatic appearing stories shared on social media relating to calcium scores, like this one here posted by Brad Gerstner with nearly a million views, are misguided and demonstrate a misunderstanding of how heart attacks happen and what actually prevents them. In fact, studies show that nearly 90% of patients with stable coronary artery disease, considering PCI, share these misconceptions. And we'll come back to this one a little later. I do realize I might sound a little critical here, but that is not my intention. I think it's great that these guys have increased awareness of calcium score CTs and have started some important conversations like this one. So in this video, I want to help clarify some misconceptions and then provide a bit more nuance related to one, who should actually get a calcium score CT because it's really not for everyone and two, the risks associated most importantly, the risks of over-intervening and placing unnecessary stents. So first, a bit of background to put things into context. As most of you know, the coronary arteries are the arteries that feed the heart itself. In coronary artery disease, there is buildup of plaque in coronary arteries, usually over a very long period of time. Some of this plaque can calcify, which is very easy to see on CT scan without contrast because it's very high density. The presence of calcification in the coronary arteries, like in this image here, does indicate the presence of atherosclerosis. And since calcifications are often present many years before developing any symptoms, they can be an early indication of coronary artery disease. As the arteries continue to narrow and harden over time, the amount of blood feeding the heart eventually can't keep up with demand, initially with exercise, and so you can start to get symptoms like chest pain or shortness of breath with exercise. This is so-called stable angina in the setting of stable coronary artery disease. Now, the presence of coronary artery disease does put people at risk for an acute event, like a heart attack, which involves a very sudden blockage of a coronary artery, usually due to disruption of plaque and an acute thrombus or clot. And this can sometimes lead to sudden death. If not, treatment of a heart attack or myocardial infarction, MI for short, often involves percutaneous coronary intervention or PCI, which often includes placement of stents. And PCI undoubtedly saves lives specifically in patients with MI or unstable coronary artery disease. But it's key to understand that an acute event is very different than severe stable coronary artery disease. For instance, if you gradually develop 90% stenosis in a coronary artery, which slowly progresses to a complete occlusion, that is not how a heart attack happens. A heart attack is an acute or sudden change from, say, 70% to 100%, caused by, again, disruption of soft plaque and acute thrombus. When it's a slow and chronic process, your body creates collateral vessels that can feed the downstream heart muscle. So, why are we talking about all of this? Well, key point number one, if you have stable coronary artery disease and severe stenosis, getting a stent to open that up can help with your symptoms, say during exercise, but these stents do not prevent heart attack. I'll say that again. 
getting a stent for stable coronary artery disease does not prevent an acute event. And this has been shown over and over again in the literature. Yet, most patients with stable disease believe that PCI reduces their chance of a heart attack. Like in this study, where nearly 90% of patients who were consented for PCI with stable coronary artery disease thought PCI would reduce their risk of heart attack. So, stories like this, where people with no symptoms find coronary calcifications that lead to more testing and then placement of stents, involve people walking away feeling like they had their lives saved by the procedure, and then convincing others to go get it. But, as we just explained, this is misguided, and in many cases, those stents were completely unnecessary. Further support, a large multicenter trial looking at over 140,000 stents placed in non-acute settings found that only about half were appropriate, and about 12% were definitely not appropriate. And these procedures are not without risk. So, if PCI doesn't prevent death in people with stable coronary artery disease, what does and how does a calcium score help? So, traditionally, your risk of heart attack is determined by taking into account your traditional risk factors, including things like age, smoking status, blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, and your cholesterol level. And then estimating your 10-year risk using something like the Framingham Risk Score. And you can reduce your risk by managing risk factors that are modifiable, i.e. stop smoking, lower your blood pressure, lose weight, manage your diabetes, and lower your cholesterol. This includes lifestyle changes like diet and exercise and medications like statins. And key point number two, these things do save lives. For primary prevention, i.e. for people at risk who have not yet had an event, Statins significantly reduce the chance of heart attack, stroke, and death. So, where does the calcium score fit in? As mentioned, plaque in the coronary arteries can calcify over time, making it very easy to see on CT without contrast, which is a very quick and non-invasive test. These calcifications do indicate underlying coronary artery atherosclerosis, which often predates symptomatic stable coronary artery disease. More calcification generally indicates more atherosclerosis. So, a calcium score is essentially just a measurement of the size and density of calcium in your coronary arteries. A calcium score of 0 indicates no calcifications and very low risk, 1 to 100, mild, 100 to 400, moderate, and over 400, severe. As mentioned earlier, heart attacks are usually caused by soft plaque not this hard calcified plaque. But still, in general, the higher the calcium score, the higher the overall burden of atherosclerosis, and the higher the chance of an acute event. And remember, patients with higher risk should get primary prevention with modification of risk factors and taking a statin. Quick sidebar, taking a statin actually increases your calcium score. This can sound a little counterintuitive at first because it lowers your risk, but The thought is that statins help convert vulnerable soft plaque into stable, mature calcified plaque. Again, in general, higher calcium scores indicate higher risk. Remember, we already measure risk using traditional risk factors we mentioned earlier, but key point number three, the calcium score is an independent risk factor and that it can further improve determination of risk. Using traditional risk factors and a coronary artery calcium score, you can calculate the 10-year risk of coronary heart disease using the MESA calculator. However, it's uncertain whether this actually leads to any clinical benefit, i.e. actually saves lives over and above using traditional risk factors alone. So, who benefits most from a coronary calcium score CT? Let's break it down by group. People who are already considered high risk based on traditional measurements should be getting aggressive treatment to lower risk factors, often including a statin. So getting a calcium score CT doesn't help much in that group. For people who are intermediate or borderline risk, the calcium score can help stratify risk further and guide treatment by either stepping up or stepping down the risk. Those with a higher calcium score may benefit from statins or more intensive therapy, which can save lives over time. And those that are borderline with a calcium score of zero may be able to avoid taking a statin. 
For intermediate risk patients with a calcium score of zero, the suggestion is to repeat the scan in five years as a reasonable proportion of these people will develop coronary calcifications. In patients who are traditionally low risk, the vast majority of these people are appropriately low risk. But if you have a family history of premature coronary artery disease, even if you're low risk, a calcium score CT is recommended because many will have plaque that puts them at higher risk. By better identifying those at higher risk, appropriate primary prevention can save lives. So key point number four, a calcium score CT is most useful in people with intermediate risk or low risk with a family history of premature cardiovascular disease. So what about those with low risk but no family history or other concern? In studies looking at this group, the proportion of people who are actually upgraded to intermediate or high risk based on calcium score alone is small, i.e. about 3 to 10%. And of that group, those that actually had an event, i.e. correctly upgraded, was even smaller. So the pretest probability in this group is low. For example, in over 10,000 patients with low risk in four studies, only 0.3 to 1.5% were upgraded correctly. For primary prevention of a coronary event, lifestyle changes in statins reduce but do not eliminate risk. The number needed to treat is about 100 in this group for statins, i.e. about 100 people taking statins can prevent one event. So that's a massive number of calcium score CTs in a massive number of patients with a high price tag to correctly upgrade the risk in a very small percent in which an even smaller percent will actually benefit in theory. As a result, to date, no study demonstrates any outcome benefit in this broader population. And in real life practice, these tests are not benign. It is true that a single calcium score CT on its own in isolation is safe. People often cite potential harms like radiation dose, but the dose is very, very small. The real risks lie in what happens downstream. Firstly, incidental findings like lung nodules are not uncommon and may need to be followed up with more CTs, which means even more radiation dose, cost to the system, and more stress. Second, though, knowing that you have coronary calcifications can help certain people take control and be more proactive. For others, it can add stress and increase visits to the doctor and emergency department, say for benign causes of chest pain like heartburn. But Key point number five, in my mind, the most important risk is the potential for the test to start a snowball effect with more tests and cardiac imaging, like a coronary CT angiogram, which may show stenosis, and then a diagnostic angiogram, and then placement of stents in asymptomatic people with stable disease. And remember, that can help with symptoms, but does not prevent acute events. These people who get stents walk away feeling like they had their lives saved all because of the calcium score CT. Just like Brad's friend, see the tweet on the screen, who, based on his own story, was already being offered a statin by his doctor. In the real world, this all leads to over-intervention. An angiogram and stent placement is not without risk, and all of this is costly to the system. Putting this all together, it's important to take a step back and think about the benefit-to-risk ratio in each of these groups. For people who are intermediate risk or low risk with family history, the benefits of the test likely outweigh the risks. But if you did this test in everyone over 40, the costs and risks outweigh the benefits. Quick caveat, this is not intended to be medical advice. If you're well informed and have a specific concern, you should talk to your doctor and make a decision that's right for you. Quick sidebar, statins are known to increase calcium scores despite reducing risk, as mentioned earlier, likely because it stabilizes plaques, leading to more calcification. Still, a calcium score CT can help stratify risk in people on statins, but the association is weaker than in non-statin users. To clarify, the biggest benefit of a calcium score CT is measuring risk at a single point in time. And follow-ups are best used in specific situations, like in people with a calcium score of zero and intermediate risk. Thanks for listening.